Okay, so intelligence is a very difficult <laughs> concept. Yeah. And maybe that's the reason why many people try to avoid, you know, uh, defining it yeah, or narrowing it down. Um, I've worked on this question for many, many years now. And we went through the literature, in psychology literature, philosophy literature, and AI literature, what individuals, researchers, and also then um, groups came up with definitions. And they are very diverse. Um, but there seems to be one recurrent theme and if you want to put it in one sentence um, then you could define intelligence as an agent's ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments or to succeed in a wide range of environments and if you now look at this sentence and you ask wow well, how can this single sentence capture sort of the complexity of intelligence yeah um, there are two answers to that first um, many aspects of intelligence are then emergent properties yeah, like being able to learn I mean if I want to succeed or um, solve a problem I need to acquire new knowledge so learning is an emergent phenomenon of this definition and the second answer is this is just a sentence which consists of a few words yeah what you really have to do and that's the hard part transform it into meaningful equations yeah and then study these equations and that's what I have done in the last 12 years. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question um, whether resource bounds should be included in any definition of intelligence or not. And the natural answer is, of course, they should. Yeah. Um, well, there are several problems. Um, the first one is that nobody ever came up with a reasonable theory of bounded rationality. I mean, people have tried. Yeah. So it seems to be very hard. Yeah. And this is not specific to AI or intelligence, but seems to be symptomatic yeah. in science. So if you look at several fields, and I mean physics is the crown discipline, um, theories have been developed from Newton's mechanic, um, general relativity theory, quantum field theory, standard model of particle physics. They are more and more precise, but they get less and less compute computable. So um, and having a computable theory plays, it's not a principle, you know, in developing these theories. Of course, at some point you have to test the theories and you want to do something with them, and then you need a computable theory, um, and this is a very difficult issue, and you have to approximate them or do something about it. Yeah? But having computational resources built into the fundamental theories, uh, that is at least in physics, and if you look at most other disciplines, that's not how things work. You design theories so that they describe your phenomenon as well as possible. And the computational aspect is secondary. Of course, if it's incomputable and you can't do anything with it, well, you have to come up with some other theory. Yeah? But this always comes second. And only in computer science, very naturally, computer scientists think about how can I design an efficient algorithm to solve my problem. Yeah. And since AI, artificial intelligence, is sitting in the computer science department traditionally, um, the um, mainstream thought is how can I build a resource-bounded intelligent system. And I agree that ultimately this is what we want. Yeah. But the problem is so hard yeah, that we should take, I think, um, or at least a large fraction of the scientists should take this approach, model the problem first, define the problem first, and once we are confident that we have solved this problem, then go to the second phase and try to approximate the theory and make a computational theory out of it. And then there are many, many possibilities. Then you can still try to develop a resource-bounded theory of intelligence, yeah. which will be really very, very hard if you want to have it sort of very principled. Or you do some heuristics, or, or, or many, many options. Well, the short answer, maybe I'm not smart enough to come up with a um, resource-bounded theory of intelligence, therefore I only developed one without resource constraints. That would be the short answer. <laughs> okay, so, so now we have this informal definition that intelligence is an agent's ability to succeed or achieve goals in a wide range of environments. Um, the point is that you can formalize this theory 
and we have done that and um, this theory is called IXI or universal AI. So universal AI is a general field theory and IXI is this particular agent which acts optimally in this sense. And so that works as follows. So it has a planning component and it has a learning component. And what the learning component does is think about a robot walking around in your environment and the beginning has very little or no knowledge about the world. Yeah? So what it has to do is it has to acquire um, data and knowledge from the world and then build its own model of the world, how the world works. And it does that so they're very powerful general theories how to learn a model from data from very complex data, very complex scenarios. And this theory is rooted in Kolmogorov complexity algorithmic information theory. And the basic idea is you look for the simplest model which describe your data sufficiently well. Okay? So and this agent or robot has to do that continuously, gets new data out of this model. So now this agent has this model, so that's the learning part. Now it can use this model for predicting the future, yeah? <clears throat> at least certain aspects. And then it uses these predictions in order to make decisions. So the agent now thinks, if I do this action, and this action, and this action, then this and this will happen, and this is good or bad. Yeah? I come to the good or bad part soon. Okay? And if I do this other action, then it's maybe better or worse. Yeah? And then the only thing, only in quotation marks, is what the agent has to do is think about all possible future action sequences and take the one which is best. Okay? According to the model which the agent has learned, which is not perfect, but which over time gets better and better. And then finally, you have to qualify what is best mean, and that's the utility part or achieving goals or succeeding. The agent gets occasional reward from a teacher either. Yeah, um, it could be just a human it interacts with, yeah, or it could be built in. So, for instance, if the battery level is low, it's bad. If the battery level is high, it's good. Yeah. If it finds a rock on Mars, it's good. If it falls down a cliff, it's bad. Yeah. So, um, so you have these rewards. And the goal of the agent is then to maximize his reward over its lifetime. Okay? And that's the planning part. So the learning part, prediction part, planning part, then it leads to actions, and so on. And then the cycle continues. So maybe let me add. So so so, so this theory, um, that's the that's the IC agent, um, it's mathematically rigorously and well defined, it's essentially unique and um, you can prove um, amazing properties of this agent. In a certain sense, you can prove that it's the most intelligent system possible. I mean, I'm translating now mathematical theorems in words, and it's always sort of tricky, yeah? but um, that's the essence. Um, the downside is that it's incomputable, so you asked before about um, the uh, resource-bounded intelligence. So this has infinite or needs infinite computational resources, and in order to do something with it, you need to approximate that, and we have done that in recent years also. At the moment, it's at the toy stage, so we can play, we can play Pac-Man, Tic-Tac-Toe, um, some simple form of poker, and some other games. Um, and the, the point is not, I mean, of course, it's trivial to play Tic-Tac-Toe, yeah? and Pac-Man is also not that hard. Yeah? And the point is that it's an agent who has no knowledge about um, these games, starts really blank, yeah? And just by interacting with the environment, it doesn't even know the rules of the game. Yeah? By interacting with this poker environment or with the Pac-Man environment, it figures out what is going on and learns how to behave well. So um, the the cool thing really is, and the difference to to many other projects. I mean, there's um, Deep Blue who plays you know chess better than um, the grandmasters, yeah. But it was specifically the design system to play chess. You know, it can't play Go, right? Yeah. Um, and so on. Yeah. So, but this system is not tailored to any particular application. If you interface it with any problem, so in the theory, it can be any problem, chess or solving a scientific problem, it will learn to do that very well, indeed optimally. The approximations we have at the moment are, of course, very limited. But if you look at these approximations, they use standard compressors for the model learning part. There's nothing about Pac-Man 
in these compressors, the standard data compressors. You know, um, for the planning part, we use standard Monte Carlo, so random search. Um, this has also nothing to do with a particular problem or a game, and this approximation is already able to learn by itself these various games. So there is no Pac-Man knowledge built in. So the only thing, what, of course, you have to do is you have to interface the the game with this agent. So Pac-Man, you know, you have these pixels. You know, it's a I don't know, 15 by 15 grid, yeah, and each square is either wall or it's free or it's food or there's a ghost, yeah, and this piece of information you give this agent and then um, it gets negative reward if it gets eaten by a ghost, positive reward if it gets, eats a food pellet, yeah, and that's it. And the goal of the agent is to maximize sort of reward and everything else is figured out by itself. So. Um, so Monte Carlo algorithms are very general. Um, it's a very general algorithm to um, stochastically approximate various high-dimensional problems. Let's phrase it this way. Um, it's used um, for computing volumes in very high, so hyper volumes in very high-dimensional spaces. That's probably not what <laughs> people here care about. Yeah, um, but um, in this context, it's used. Um, to search through these search trees. So um, if you play chess, you can make a move out of maybe 20, 30, yeah, then your opponent can move yeah, out of 20, 30, then you have 900 combination and you have this search tree which grows and grows and grows and they are enormous. Yeah? And there's no way uh, to search this tree exhaustively. If you could, you would have an optimal chess player problem solved, yeah? but it's practically not feasible. And Monte Carlo searches stochastically through these trees and um, the particular version we have used is so-called upper confidence um, bound algorithm for tree search <laughs> which has been invented in the context of computer go actually so computer go was long in a very poor stage so played very poorly but with this single trick this UCT algorithm it really boosted computer go from um, from beginners play to I think amateur level, I mean still rather low, but it was a significant step forward. And this UCT trick again has nothing to do with, with Go per se. Um, it is um, a very intelligent, well actually it's a very simple but um, very powerful um, way of balancing exploration and exploitation. So if you search for possibilities, there are always two options, you know, either you search where you believe, yeah. Um, things are good or you search where you have very little knowledge and maybe there is a gold nugget right but you just don't know so what should you do should you stay where you know things are good yeah. or have strong belief or should explore yeah. and this is a very difficult problem and um, this UCT Monte Carlo tree search algorithm um, which we used uh, is a smart way of um, approximating providing an approximate solution to this problem. Um, another beautiful thing about this algorithm is they are, well, there's one parameter essentially to play with, yeah? um, and that's it. It's not, you know, it's like some other algorithms, maybe neural nets, you know, have net structure, you have thousands of parameters, you, you have to adjust, yeah. Um, but here you have essentially one parameter to control. That's the exploration sort of bias. So, as I already mentioned, so one big part of the AI problem is to get the induction problem right. Yeah? So to induce models from data. And if you want a general purpose AI system, we need a very powerful way of doing induction. And um, there's a very important principle, Occam's Razor, which tells take the simplest theory, which is consistent with your data. And that's the best model. And so this principle has been quantified, and the most fundamental quantification is via Kolmogorov complexity, which quantifies what complexity or simplicity means. Yeah? And, and then Solomonov has put all these pieces, these philosophical and technical pieces together, and developed his universal scheme of 
originally called it induction, although it would probably be better to call it universal scheme of prediction. So what Solomonov does, it takes a past data stream, like you know, weather data, sun, rain, rain, sun, 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 and then asks what comes next. And that's actually making a prediction. It in a sense bypasses the explicit need of first coming up with a good weather model and then using this for making prediction. It has both steps in one. Okay. Um, normal science works like that. You first infer a model and then usually often not scientists but somebody else that uses these models for making predictions. And um, there have been various um, inventions or developments um, more closer to the usual scientific route, first inferring models, uh, what is sort of induction proper. Um, one of them is the minimal message length principle, which has been developed um, by Bolton and Wallace um, here in Melbourne in Australia, and um, then um, much further developed by David Dow later. And um, MML, the MML principle um, is mainly concerned with inferring models from data. Of course, one can use then these models, but that's sort of not the primary issue. Where Solomonov is mainly concerned about prediction. But um, there's actually, that's often how it's put, but there's actually another big difference, and I think that's the more important difference. Solomonov tries to get a universal predictor which works in any kind of situation. The price to pay is that it's again incomputable, but you have a beautiful theory, and you know, then later you approximate that. And indeed, you can also use Solomonov for making inductions. It's not that it only can use do predictions. While MML has been designed more from a somewhat more practical point of view, that um, you want a mimic scientific induction, but in such a way that you really can use it, you know, that it's computationally feasible. And that has been their major theme. But also in MML, you can think of a very fundamental model class which corresponds to the Solomonov case, you know, and then again it is comparable. Bayesian reasoning, so this inductive reasoning, that is deeply built into uh, IXC, and deductive logical reasoning is in a certain sense. Um, the limit of inductive reasoning for beliefs which are very close to one, very close to certain, or very close to, um, or what is the opposite of certain? Yeah, certain that it not that it does not happen. Yeah. So if you reason inductively in a world where you have very strong beliefs which are so close to sureness, yeah, um, then it reduces to deductive reasoning. So in this sense, it is explicitly built in deductive reasoning. 